Hey, Iran. Greetings from Vienna. Uh, hello from Miami. Yeah, let's 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 jump right into Miami, man, because there's something different about a hackathon than a conference. So why don't you give us your impressions uh, about Bitcoin Miami? Um. Huh. I actually, uh, it was. It was a bit, uh, a bit more of like a shitcoin conference than any other Bitcoin conference I've ever been to. With tens of Bitcoin. thousands. Of yeah, there was, there were. They say there were fifty thousand people who came to Miami um, for like conference or conference related things. I think there were only twelve thousand people who actually had tickets to the conference. But the city is full of people advertising all kinds of. I don't even know what this stuff is. Um, it's really, you know, it feels like uh, every four years we get this this massive influx of of, of tourists um, who are here to try and sell you their coins and then leave. <laughs> so that's that's what we've got so running on my end. Try and sell our what? coin while you were there. What? what? Sorry. Did you try and sell our coin while you were there? No, I tried to sell sovereign and sovereignty. Uh, if people want to discover more about it and buy uh, SOV, that's cool. And I remind you, SOV is not a coin. Um, so, uh, unless you mean by, by our coin, Bitcoin, in which case, absolutely. fucking <laughs> um, <laughs> um, So, yeah, I mean, uh, one interesting thing about Miami, which I've just sort of just been wondering around, um, is there's a lot of graffiti. Um, like Bitcoin graffiti everywhere. Uh, it feels like, you know, moments before the revolution in some kind of like, a, you know, the beginning of a movie where they're trying to explain the future to you, that montage, that's what it feels like. There is like, <laughs> right down the road from my um, hotel is a Papa John's, which um, appropriately has a giant flashing neon sign that says uh, Bitcoin ATM inside. Um, it's, uh, it's very cool. Uh, there's, um, there is a feeling like, you know, uh, the future is not evenly distributed, but it's already here. And, uh, and Miami seems to be a little bit ahead of the curve. Cool. Anything that stood out for you during the conference? Because, you know, we've all been sitting here on discord and limited live stream and everybody in the community, you know, what, what give us a couple of the highlights. Well, honestly, I have no idea. I wasn't in any of the, uh, talks um i uh if you were in the hall track <laughs> yeah um but what was very cool was um the number of people who seemed to be aware of and and interested in sovereign like i couldn't walk five meters without someone stopping me to try and tell me like you know that they were excited about sovereign or they just started using sovereign or um you know that 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 they that they're finally this is what they've been waiting for. And that was that was very, very cool. And and what was even weirder was um, there were, you know, like I said, there were like 50,000 people. Um, and so I met some people who I'd known um, just randomly in the past and had never been into crypto. Uh, and they were telling me about, you know, they'd recently gotten into Bitcoin and they were down in Miami to do their own research. And they were really excited about some of the projects and I said, oh yeah, cool, like, like what projects are you excited about? And they said, oh, well, this is one that I've heard about. It's called Sovereign. I was like, whoa, this is, uh, this is very cool. Tell me about it. Wow, never heard that one. <laughs> cool. Yeah, so, so watching it from afar, it really, you know, being an American, I just thought, oh my God, this is so American. I've been gone for 30 years, but it just feels so uh, repulsingly familiar. Um, <laughs> so to speak, um, but yeah, so, so we're doing a hackathon. Um, why don't you tell people how that sort of like came to be, why we, why we, why we decided to do that. I'm, I'd like to say that like, actually, when you reached out to me, uh, via Twitter DM and asked me to, to join the team, the first question you had for me was, do you know any comic book writers? <laughs> and that's how I joined was looking for some comic book writers for, for the sovereign universe. But then. We came to a different place. Why don't you give people a little bit of background about how we arrived at the idea to do Sovereign? Well, I mean, they, there's already a very large number of people who are contributing to Sovereign. Um, 
Most of them, however, have come to Sovereign by, you know, through the, the, the Sovereign Discord, started talking to someone on the team and then have become involved in contributing. And this is particularly true of developers. Um, but there is a huge world, like there's an entire world that we're looking to build. Um, you know, if Sovereign is going to achieve its its ultimate mission, which is to replace the entire financial system, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be built. And um, it's important that as many people uh, as possible have easy access to being able to contribute to building Sovereign. And at the same time, we want to incalculate from the very beginning a culture of open contribution, right? So even though if you go to the Discord, you can see the conversations that the devs are having and you can anyone can participate and you can go to the GitHub and anyone can make a pull request. It's important if you want to build an open source community that you actively look to reach out to, um, to as many uh, uh, developers as possible and in particular make entrance or make it really, really easy for people to kind of get involved. And I think that's the great thing about the software is it makes it, it's a really, really easy entry point to being able to start contributing to Sovereign and to the broader um, Bitcoin DeFi ecosystem. Yeah, so so um, one of the things that's interesting is that we're doing this on, a, on an Ethereum platform, Gitcoin, which has to date uh, raised over twelve and a half million dollars for for open source development in, in the crypto uh, sector, and are you familiar with anything similar in the Bitcoin world? How's how's development happening in open source software in the, in, on the Bitcoin side of things? Yeah, so most of the development that's happening in Bitcoin outside of sort of um, sovereign, right, and the sovereign ecosystem occurs in two types of groups. One is Bitcoin Core. Bitcoin Core is um, can be uh, intimidating to join. There's a lot, like the Bitcoin Core code can be complicated. Um, there's a lot you have to learn. Um, and um, you kind of need to earn your chops and earn your way into Bitcoin Core. Uh, and I think that's great. You know, Bitcoin Core is the is the... The, 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 the group of collaborators the who are making who are making sure that Bitcoin remains the most secure, safest, um, most reliable blockchain out there, right? And so it should require an additional level of effort to be able to properly contribute to that. Then the other um, big open source effort is Lightning Network. And Lightning Network is primarily being driven by <clears throat> um, a few companies who are building on it. And it looks a little bit different. So it's in, in some ways easier to start contributing to Lightning. But also because there are a number of companies that are building around Lightning, there are also um, some slightly different variants or standards around how they're building. And they have um, different, uh, slightly different visions around that. Um, with Sovereign, um, I think um, there's an opportunity to do something a little bit different. And I think the Ethereum community um, has developed a very interesting way of, of driving collaboration, not so much on core Ethereum, right? So, so Ethereum core is primarily driven by the Ethereum foundation, but around all of the applications uh, and extensions um, of, of features that could exist on Ethereum. And um, uh, Gitcoin has done a phenomenal job around building a platform which um, makes it easier to reach out to developers, particularly Solidity developers, and um, and 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 you know reward them for participating in open source projects. And I think um, you know I, I I saw on Twitter there was this uh, guy who was on one of the panels uh, in the conference like two days ago, um, and he uh, was saying. Um, you know, uh, Bitcoin, 
toxic Bitcoin maximalism is necessary. And if you're against toxic Bitcoin maximalism, you're against Bitcoin. And if you're against Bitcoin, you're against freedom. And then, thankfully, Eric Voorhees got on the stage immediately after and said, yeah, well, that's just true. And, and I think that's, you know, it's important that we build a um, hyper-inclusive attitude to Bitcoin. Toxic, you know, like Bitcoin, now, now with less toxins, right? We need... <laughs> <laughs> we need Bitcoin to be hyper inclusive because we want to include everyone in it, right? And you can't want to include everyone in in something and at the same time have an attitude of exclusivity and worse, an attitude of aggressive, arrogant exclusivity. And so I think there's also an opportunity with the software club and with DeFi for Bitcoin to bring a different type of attitude a older type of attitude, the original type of attitude of what it is to be a Bitcoiner, which is somebody who is trying to collaborate to a global effort to increase human and individual liberty. And we do that by welcoming other people and giving them the gift of sovereignty, not by pushing them away. Yeah, I saw I, I saw Eric's uh, that clip from Eric this morning and I right before we got on and I really I really chuckled. Um, I, I think that, you know, we've been making a push to be inclusive and, and, and are looking towards a cross-chain future uh, that people can move in and out of consensus rule sets uh, frictionlessly, whether they're for assets or for participating in, in, in governance. Um, and it seems like there's, there's slowly a shift that, that more people are complaining about this, this sort of like Bitcoin is a rock thing from two bit idiot. Uh, you know, there's, there's numerous people that are, that are dissatisfied. I think that uh, you know taking a sounding uh, from Twitter is not really is not really the place anymore. Although we're all there, I don't I don't think it's it's really the, uh, you know the leadership in the space. I think you that's know, happening on the, on channels like like Discord, uh, you know, uh, on Sphinx Chat, uh, you know, uh, uh, BitcoinHackers.org, you know, Matrix servers. There's a lot of splintering of the groups where people are are actually having technical discussions. Uh, engineering discussions uh, and and it's it's Twitter is not really representative anymore of, of actually what's going on in this space. Do you would you agree with that? I think it's actually never been representative. Uh, actually, last night I was um, uh, sitting by a pool with a couple of Bitcoin core devs. We were talking about you know uh, basically this topic, and they. One of them said, you know, it was cool because he was like echoing the exact same thinking that I've had. He was saying that 2017, the block size wars, was a bit of cultural PTSD for Bitcoin. Right? There, was, there, was, there was a real threat to the basic values of the, the Bitcoin project. And not only that, the threat was coming from from the inside, there were people like you know Roger Ver, who up until that time, I think you know, had been a great friend to all of us, and you know, I got my I got some of my first paid Bitcoin from Roger as one of the founders of the Bitcoin Foundation, and and I used to have this 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 avatar picture when he was called Bitcoin Jesus of That's me right. uh, holding a cross with uh, you know with Roger's Ver Roger Ver's face on it, and I yeah. mean, it was he was a luminary in the early days, all right, yeah, and so you know. It was like there was a there was there was a, a, a schism in the family. I mean, this this the Bitcoin started as a very very small community, and and it's like it's like the people you grew up with, you know, and and so that that was the schism, and and so it was it was because it was the people that we knew, because it was a threat to the core values. It was a deeply emotional and deeply important threat um, and 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 Bitcoin as a community galvanized around defending its core values but there's a price that you pay for any civil war right and 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 and, and it leaves scars and I think we are at the tail end of the the, the scars that that period is left. It, it I think that that wound was then opened up with with uh, with Ethereum as well, right? That also further splintered things. Yeah, uh, or so. you had people that were Bitcoiners that were interested in this first ICO 
that were interested in the co composability uh, to combat the, the uh, limitations of Bitcoin script, the, how complicated it is. And that further splinted things, and, and that seems to have been the, the primary actual tribal narrative in the last in the last years. Is you know, one one of the big issues is that while Bitcoin was going through this, right, he, the Ethereum community, at least the most vocal uh, proponents of the Ethereum community, including Vitalik, were latched onto this as an opportunity to you know explain why Bitcoin doesn't make sense or why Ethereum. There, there was a huge amount of Ethereum toxicity during that time when Bitcoin was going through a very important trial by fire, right? And a civil war. It's like, imagine there's a civil war and you're standing on the sides and saying, you know, uh, gasoline on the fire. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, so, and that, and that, and that has also left substantial, I think, I think that has left, um, a, a, a good deal of poison between uh, the two communities. I, I think that's very unfortunate, but I think that's starting to clear. Um, with, and I and I actually think that what the Taproot is going to play a very important role. Taproot is the first big um, sort of um, it's a release, right? New release in Bitcoin since Segwit, since the Civil War, and. It seems to be going through smoothly. Um, uh, there is We're like sixty percent right now, or fifty-eight percent activation. I think, I think even more actually, okay. and 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 um, and uh, it's almost certain to pass and be implemented by November with a high degree of consensus. And I think that that's going to be, I think that's going to be an opportunity and and a real signal uh, uh, that the trauma is over. We can get past it. Things move very very fast in crypto, right? And, and the culture will change again. And I think Sovereign is part of that same thing, right? That, all right, cool. We've, we've done our trauma thing. Now we're getting over it. We're, we're moving on. We're building again, right? And, um, and we can learn from the entire crypto space. There's value everywhere. And whatever is valuable, we will... Uh, uh, take advantage of it and get going. It's a perfect segue to, 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 to going back to actually, you know, you're like really a hardcore Bitcoiner, right? And we've shifted from this maximalism, you know, uh, uh, to, to being Bitcoin mutants, many of us. Um, where was the point that the light bulb, the light bulb went out for you that you just went, okay, we're going we're gonna to use Solidity smart contracts on RSK and, and do this thing. Well, how did that, where did that epiphany occur? Um, I don't think I actually ever had that moment. I think it was just years of um, thinking about things and observing. What I, I think for me, the really big, <clears throat> for years, there have been, so I think from the very beginning, there were always two things that I thought were going to be necessary and important to bring liberty to the masses and to bring Bitcoin to the masses. The first was the ability to use uh, Bitcoin, to get in and out of Bitcoin, uh, to borrow and lend with Bitcoin using a decentralized system, a system which is, um, you know, which operates the same way that Bitcoin operates, right? Uh, incorruptible, borderless permissions. Uh, the second thing was that I thought it was going to be necessary to have stable coins. I don't think people are going to transact in Bitcoin directly, uh, at least not in you know the next 10 15 probably even 20 years i think that along the way even with uh, we, even with el salvador announcing you know a national uh, approval of, of bitcoin that's really right that far away yeah i think i think this is um it may never happen uh and and it may never happen for the same reason it didn't happen with gold right so a fixed issuance commodity right is is always going to be relatively relatively volatile in comparison to something which is designed to be more stable. But that doesn't mean you want fiat. What it means is you want a representation of Bitcoin, which is um, designed- This is like heresy for Bitcoiners, dude, man. A representation of Bitcoin is like their biggest fear of fractionalizing Bitcoin. I mean, 
<laughs> well, well I, I actually don't think so. So, so let, me, let, me, let me finish the thought. What I, what I think is going to be useful for people, I think what is the best way for us to compete with fiat is to have something which can be used as a medium of exchange, right? Which is relatively non-volatile, but that you can still rely on. And so what that looks like in my mind is a Bitcoin-backed stablecoin, right? So if you continue, and, and I don't think it is heresy or shouldn't be heresy for Bitcoiners, because if you think about what a gold standard looks like, is you have a medium of exchange, which is like a banknote, but it is redeemable for digital for gold, right? Which is gold, and in our case, digital gold, which is Bitcoin. And you can make that redemption trustless. And already on Sovereign, we have Bitcoin backed stable coins. And I think that that's the path forward for El Salvador and for everyone else. Um, and so coming back to the question that you asked me, uh, I, I always used to say, if we can crack stable coins, we've won. Now, I didn't actually think about Tether as a stable coin. I just thought of it as like, you know, an IOU. Um, what I meant by that was decentralized, permissionless, censorship resistant stable coins. And then um, MakerDAO came out. I was extremely skeptical. I didn't think it was going to work at all. I just thought it was an almost impossible problem. And then about a year later, MakerDAO was still running. And that was when I really started paying attention. I think that they did something really phenomenal. I think they've lost their way since then. But what they did, proving that it was possible. That was pretty epic. Possible. Yeah, I, I think that that was a major, uh, that was a seismic shift as well. Yeah. Most definitely. So let's talk about, uh, let's bring it down to some of our bounties then uh, in, in, in Sovereign. Um, Anthony, if you could uh, shift over and, and, and share the screen that I have. Um, so on Gitcoin, uh, we have a number of partners, Interlay, API3, uh, the Ethereum name service, Covalent, and the Akash Network that are participating uh, in adding another, uh, I think it's 150,000, 175,000 now in bounties uh, to, to what it is that we're already offering. So that's in addition to the 500K, so it's like uh, 675,000. Wow. Yeah, man. And I've been getting, since you've been in Miami, uh, I've been getting PMs from, from other uh, companies that want to add and, and, and match the bounties. So it looks like we'll probably have a much higher uh, amount uh, probably by, by next week. Um, if, you go to, if you go to the Gitcoin page, um, you can sign up um, by clicking the, the Join Now button. And let's see, wait for the page to reload. And... Oops, so that's actually <laughs> classic. <laughs> okay, I can't find the link that I want right now, but uh, in the, there's a prize explorer. Let's see if I can, this is kind of embarrassing. Um, classic screen sharing stuff. There we go, see prizes. Um, so we have uh, 18 bounties up uh, in four different tracks and those tracks uh, are decentralization and privacy, um, finance. Well, here we go. Okay, so I need to click this all. All sponsors. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about this, guys. It's a classic, classic problem. Um, Everything always works before you need it to actually work. There we go. All bounties, please. Is this uh, just the internet slowly loading? see we lost you there oh, okay that's what happened all right gotcha um so um what i was trying to do was show one of the uh, prize bounties that we have for bitcoin back stable coins so why don't you talk about that a little bit the products that we already have on the on the platform um and and what we'd like to see come out of this bounty 
Well, I think, you know, it's Sovereign is probably, almost certainly actually, the most feature-rich DeFi uh, platform anywhere. So it has all of the basic financial primitives. It's got stable coins, so it's got Bitcoin backed stable coins. It's got the IOU centralized type stable coins, which is consumed through um, a, a, a different project, which is um, building in the sovereign ecosystem. Um, called Tablefish aggregate the liquidity of all of those different stable coins and also mean that you can get this consolidated aggregated token, which is uh, censorship resistant. Um, there's uh, trading via an AMM. It's actually two types of AMM, depending on the asset. You can choose between a V1 or a V2 uh, Oracle-based AMM. There's a decentralized Oracle based on the AMM. There's lending and borrowing, and then combining the AMM with the lending and borrowing, there's margin trade. So extremely feature-rich in terms of the users. And then beyond that, there's also the plutocracy governance system. And most recently, the Origins uh, project launchpad, allowing projects, um, and Babelfish will be uh, the first to use this, uh, to, um, to launch their projects and, and launch their tokens. So um, it, it truly, you know, I think it's like amazing what the um, contributors, the developers, and the sorcerers who have been building on Sovereign have built in such a short space of time, um, the, tr the full breadth. And there's a whole bunch of more stuff coming. Um, and I think part of that is the sovereign time. Cool. Um, so which which things are you most interested in seeing from the bounty tracks that we have uh, for people to be building on? What is the, well, there's different questions there. There's the stuff that you're most interested in, and then there's the stuff that we need the most. So why don't you maybe uh, uh, give a little bit on those two? Well, Personally, I'm extremely. Anthony, I've got actually now uh, finally the uh, screen. There we go. Well, yeah, maybe we should go uh, one by one. Maybe you can lead us through it. Okay, cool. Um, so in the finance track, we have options trading, fiat gateways, Bitcoin backed stable coins, which we just discussed, uh, DeFi strategies and bots. Um, why don't you talk about the, any one of those? Yeah, so, you know, I think. Uh, I'm going to pull out on that one, uh, Fiat Gateways. Um, I think it's, um, so right now, uh, you can actually use Fiat directly. And there are starting to be people who um, are, are buying their first Bitcoin on Sovereign, right? So they're skipping the, it's kind of like, you know how Africa managed to skip landlines and go directly to mobile phones? Some people who are coming into the space now are managing, because of Sovereign, to skip centralized exchanges entirely and go directly to self-sovereign custody uh, and their own, you know, uh, uh, self-sovereign control. So um, that's through a company called Transact. But we can do better. We can do um, things like integrating BISC or building out peer-to-peer -peer trading which would allow people to move into fiat in a decentralized way as well. And that's something which is extremely exciting. But beyond that, if we can make that a frictionless experience, then it means that onboarding onto Sovereign becomes so much easier. Onboarding into the entire space becomes so much easier. And so this, I think, is a huge uh, uh, thing. And, and, and one of the things we should always be focused on is reducing the barriers of entry, reducing the user frictions, um, reducing how difficult it is to get in uh, and to get out. People and want to get to out. Their gains, That's right. right? That's Unfortunately, right. people still want to realize their gains in fiat. Well, I don't think it's unfortunate. People need to live. Uh, and, 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 you know, the fact that you can, like, collateralize your Bitcoin and borrow fiat effectively against your Bitcoin means that you never have to sell your Bitcoin, so, but you can still pay rent. So I, don't, I think that's, like, the big purpose of sovereign. So, um, yeah, so the easier it is to get in and out, the more people are going to be able to comfortably and easily manage their entire financial lives through Sovereign. And, and so anything which does that is great. I think also, so let's talk a little bit about DeFi strategies and bots. Yeah. Um, you know, so bots play a large role uh, in, in market making, uh, in, in, in the Ethereum space. Um, 
people often feel threatened by them. Why don't you give a little bit of information on our view on, on strategies and bots and what we'd like to see? Yeah, I mean, there's just a huge amount. Right now, there's just so many opportunities to profit uh, in the Southern ecosystem. And if there were easier ways of taking advantage of them, then more people would be able to profit. So what are those profitable opportunities? Um, ARB, for example. So, uh, you know, people like to say they're the price of Bitcoin or the price of Ethereum or whatever, right? Bitcoin doesn't have a price. It has many, many, many prices. Right? Every single exchange is a slightly different price. Uh, same with Ethereum. Even if you look in the Ethereum ecosystem, right, there's always like a difference between the price of any asset in Uniswap versus SushiSwap. <clears throat> and, and you can basically earn free money by arbitraging those prices. In other words, by um, selling where the price is high and at the same time uh, 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 buying where the price is low. Right? And so that's like a delta neutral you keep the same this amount. It's available at the at the sovereign node level. I've never been really clear about that because we talk about running sovereign nodes. Yeah. So so in the sovereign repo, you can actually find our bots. They're just a little bit difficult to use. And so one of the things that you could do is make it easier for more people to take advantage of these R bots. Another thing is the sovereign node, right? So just by running a sovereign node, you actually get a built-in box. You also get a liquidation, the ability to liquidate positions. Liquidating positions can be an extremely profitable activity, and it helps keep the sovereign ecosystem uh, safe and financially sound. Right. So every time you liquidate a position, you get um, a five percent bonus or whatever it was that you liquidate. That's that's extremely profitable. So uh, I think that I think that most people have focused on sovereign uh, as a platform and and sovereign as a SOV uh, as a token. Um, and don't really have the understanding that, that Sovereign is a protocol that's been set in motion and that we can't change without a vote in, in, in bitocracy. Um, so really encouraging those of you that are, that are watching the stream, that want to hack with us, um, check out the repo. Um, and what we're looking for is, is, is to, to build on the smart contracts that we, that we already have here. Uh, at a protocol level, um, that can be that can be implemented. Um, let's move on to um, to integrations. So, <clears throat> draw the curtains. Now let's move on to integration. The integrations bounties we have on chain identity, uh, bridges, 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 ENS, and other uh, uh, name uh, registration uh, integrations. Uh, and then Lightning Network uh, and wallets. Why don't you jump on the wallet issue? Yeah, so um, there's a lot of wallets out there. Some of them are open source, some of them are not. Um, but again, coming back to how can we make it as easy as possible for people to uh, participate uh, in the sovereign ecosystem and use the sovereign protocol. And so the more wallets that are integrated with the system, every time we integrate a new wallet, that entire user base now can frictionlessly start to use Sovereign. And it also becomes, there become more and more options uh, for uh, the people who, who want to start using the Sovereign protocol. And that's really important because you don't want to have, you know, just one way of accessing the protocol because that is not decentralized. That becomes a vector of attack. And so we make the entire ecosystem and the protocol more robust also by uh, making, by having multiple different ways in which you can approach, uh, interact, and use the protocol. So that's essentially at the, at the base level integrating with RSK at this point, correct? Or is, that, or is it separate from integrating with RSK for wallets? Um, well, I mean, you'd need to be able to read uh, the rootstock uh, chain, and 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 as Sovereign uh, moves into the rollup, you'd need to be able to read from the rollup. Um, so there may be an aspect where there is an integration with the with the rootstock chain, but um, I think it's more a question of being able to interact and integrate with uh, with wallets and APIs. 
or put a, a create a pull request. So, for example, like you know, a, a, a open source wallet like Wasabi. Uh, if you write the pull request, uh, which will make um, Wasabi interoperable. Um, yeah. So we have Max uh, Max Hillebrand from from Wasabi, who's going to be one of the judges. Uh, and and uh, also, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the Gitcoin team uh, for integrating. So last month, they RSK did a, a hackathon on Gitcoin as well, uh, which brought in RSK integration. And now, as a result of that, we have for for Sovathon, we have SOV uh, as a native integration uh, on on Gitcoin, which means that anybody now can can fund. Uh, or pay for uh, a bounty uh, uh, in in SOV on on Gitcoin. So that's that's really a spectacular thing. Um, talk about so this is a good place to also be talking about the role, right? Because uh, Uniswap has just implemented Arbitrum. I think it was yesterday or the day before. We've been working on on Arbitrum uh, for the last six weeks. Why don't you get let people know where we're at in it's a good opportunity to let people know where we're at in that in that development. Yes, yeah, so Arbitrum is um, a um, rollup protocol which um, we've been very excited about for a long time. Um, and what it does is it helps take the computational load off of the chain, so the, the L1 chain, which allows for uh, reducing the load on the L1 chain, keeps the nodes nice and tight and small. Um, but at the same time, it allows you to scale the amount of users, the amount of throughput, the types of computational complexity that you're able to, to deal with. So it's also going to have amazing, uh, amazing results on fees as well. Um, that's right. What, what's the average fee right now on on RSK for a transaction that we're doing in cents? About, so a standard transaction is about uh, ten to fifteen cents. Um, generally speaking, it's about seventy times cheaper than Ethereum right now. But uh, with the Arbitrum rollup, uh, we may even be able to get to the point where most transactions feel like they are free. And basically, the idea with the the rollups, right, and where we would like to get to with Sovereign is um, that Sovereign feels um, as smooth, as reliable, as frictionless, as fast, or even better than uh, a centralized exchange, right? So ultimately, what we're really competing with is centralized finance, and that's, uh, that's what we need to be able to outperform. So. Cool. Let's, um, let's, let's yeah. roll on because I'm noticing that we've got about uh, 12 minutes left and I'd like to, to get through a couple more of the bounties. So one of the things that people have been asking from the beginning of the project is when are you going to be on CoinGecko, when are you going to be on DeFi Pulse, when are you going to be on all of these, these sites that list? And uh, most people don't understand that you have to provide an API. Uh, to, to that. We've been very, very slow uh, in, in moving forward with, with rolling out products. We're slowly building now a data science team. Um, and so we have a number of, of uh, uh, bounties up for, for data science. Together with our partner API3DAO, who's using uh, AirNode, uh, they put up 50,000 uh, uh, that we're matching uh, for uses of, of um, AirNode for data science. We're also looking for oracles, uh, advanced analytics and simulations, uh, improved blockchain explorers. Why don't you take two out of there and give a pretty short, pretty short thing about what it is that we're looking for, and then we'll do the last ones uh, and close it up. Yeah. So I mean, one of the things that is most empowering is when users can see exactly what they're doing and know what's exactly what's going on in the protocol, and so. The more available, the more easy to read, the more accessible data is, the more we empower people. Basically, knowledge is power. And so what we want to do is work with people and have developers come and make it really, really easy to take the knowledge about what is happening with their position, what is happening with the protocol, and place it in the hands of users. Mm -hmm. Cool. So we've also got uh, privacy and decentralization as a track. Um, there we've got shielded transactions. Uh, Sphinx chat integration, arbitrary messaging bridges, um, node deployments and infrastructure, and a decentralized order book. 
I think that the decentralized order book and the privacy and shielded transactions are the two things I'd like to hear you uh, um, give a statement about. Yeah, so <clears throat> let's start with the order book, right? Because of the constraints of layer one systems, and that doesn't matter if it's Ethereum or BSC or uh, Rootstock or whatever, uh, you can't really have efficient order of books, right? So if you go to a centralized exchange, you'll see, you know, you can put in bids at different prices, and also you can put in different kinds of order types. So you can make a, a, a market order where you'll just buy whatever the price is right now, or you can put in a limit order, or you can put in a stop loss order. And these things can only be done if you have uh, order books. As we move into the rollout, we will be able to start uh, introducing rollups. And this is very powerful from a capital efficiency perspective, from a user control perspective, right? Users can, can decide exactly how they want to enter or exit the position. They can have an, they can, they can be away from, from the screen and have placed an order several hours ago that will sell their position when the price reaches, you know, or protect them by, 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 by having a stop loss. These are extremely powerful things. And, um, and while they cannot efficiently, efficiently be run on layer one, on layer two they can be. And so we want to uh, build that out. And privacy, shielded transactions. So right now, everything, every transaction that you make is pseudonymous, right? So nobody knows who you are unless you in some way reveal who you are. But, um, all of the transactions that anyone is taking are visible. And this isn't good in two ways. First of all, um, if your identity ever gets attached to the address from which you're transacting, then all of your transactional history becomes available to whoever is able to make that connection. Second, when you're trading, it's sometimes important not to, not for everyone to be able to know exactly what positions you're, you're, you, you hold, right? I mean, you, the, yeah. the whole point you're trading is because you think you're, you're ahead of the curve, right? So for both of these reasons, it's very important that the system have financial privacy built into it, or at least the option for financial privacy. And what shielded transactions do is they um, uh, disconnect, they make it difficult or impossible for people to connect an address to transactional activity. The only person who's able to make that connection is the owner of the address themselves. And so it's extremely exciting and important for us to be introducing that kind of technology if we want to enhance the privacy of something. There's a lot of things that Sovereign already does that enhance users' privacy beyond what you would find on other platforms, but this is this would be another step forward. Cool, so let's take the last five minutes and, and talk a little bit about the vision. So we're putting up 250K uh, initially, plus our partners with another, um, so let's say 400K right now. Um, at the end of the hackathon, we plan on doing quadratic funding round on, on Gitcoin with another 250K. Uh, and the, so with the quadratic funding, that means that we get signaling from the community about projects and teams that they want to support further um, uh, that, have, that have won prizes. And then we have a little bit longer vision than just the grants phase. We also have, uh, we're looking forward to then projects that have, that have uh, shown some teeth and, and continue to develop and look like they're ready for a product to do a launch on, on Origins. Uh, talk a little bit about the Origins platform, what we've done so far, what's coming up, um, because this is of, of interest not only to uh, stakeholders, but to the overall community. Right. So Origins platform is, you know, every superhero has an origin story. Origins platform is, you know, a place to start uh, the next superhero story in terms of building up financial freedom. And it's a place where projects can be launched uh, can raise funding um, and get, uh, and, and most importantly, can build an initial community. So there's a very, um, th there's already an existing sovereign community. The sovereign community wants to continue to advance uh, financial sovereignty and are looking, actively looking to support projects that are engaged in this mission. 
And so by launching a sovereign, not only do you get a built-in community, but um, the uh, sovereign adoption contributors are looking to help uh, with your marketing and adoption plans. Um, and you also get the benefit of um, having the ability to launch your project in a decentralized way from day one and even um, uh, leverage the existing photography. So this is extremely exciting. And, the, and, and, and in addition to all that, and this is something I can, I can sort of uh, kind of hint to the people at, uh, who, who, are, who are watching, um, there's also a significant amount of funding um, from different um, uh, investors in the space who that is being committed to projects that are coming through the Sovereign and through Origins as follow-on funding. So um, there's a, you know, a, a large and growing community of institutional investors, uh, uh, sovereign contributors, uh, developers who are looking to help projects that are building out the ecosystem. And projects that come through the Sovereign and through Origins are going to be able to benefit from all of that. Just to go back for people that aren't familiar with Sovereign, so Origins is the set of smart contracts that were originally written uh, to launch uh, Sovereign after the initial seed round. Um, so Sovereign built a platform, launched their own token, funded it on an exchange. <laughs> it's still, I'm still kind of, it's, I've only been on the team since January and, and I'm still kind of shocked by, <laughs> by that. Do, do you wake up in the morning still sometimes and just like, oh, wow, we actually, you know, did this all our own and we're not even available on an exchange yet? <laughs> you know what's so cool about Sovereign? That Sovereign itself is Sovereign. It has relied on no other third parties. You know, it hasn't it done, you know, launched like a, a token on Ethereum until it launches. It hasn't um, created like a, a, a company to launch the project. It hasn't um, uh, tried to get onto centralized exchanges in order to launch its token. Um, it, Sovereign has been as a protocol and as a community sovereign from day one. And, and I don't know that there are many other projects that are like that. Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> right. So we are bridging to other chains, though, in the in the coming weeks. Uh, so we're bridging over to to uh, Ethereum, Alberts. We've brought liquidity in. Uh, we have the the Binance bridge uh, in in Testnet. Um, what other chains do you see would be useful for for Sovereign to be bridging to, and as part of our our bounty program for Sovereign? I, I think wherever there is. Um, uh, value and users who would be looking, you know, wh wherever there are assets and, 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 and a strong desire from users to use them, uh, I think we're going to want to see bridges. And I think that includes things like uh, Polygon right now. Um, I think it's going to include the Arbitrum rollup on Ethereum, um, maybe things like Solana. Uh, but ultimately, I think you want to be able to be interoperable with everything. Cool. So that's like a pretty good close, right? At at at, at one minute, man. Um, when are we going to see you back, like from your travels? Uh, when? Well, um, I will be out of Miami, I think, in two days. But um, you know, there is no back. Sovereign is everywhere. I'm always, I'm always back. <laughs> <laughs> see you in Discord. Thanks. Uh, thanks for helping us launch the uh, the hackathon. Thanks for helping putting everything together. This is beautiful.